honor and a privilege to be able to come before you and to share the word of God. I believe here at Grace that we've given God the principal role, which is the glorification through the scripture. Um, as a Bible expositor, my responsibility is what Paul uses the term to give the sense, to give the understanding of the text. And so our relationship with God is not an emotional thing. It's not um, something out in the ether that we can somehow catch or something like that. It's something in which we actually exercise through the text. To know the word of God is to know God. Um, I, heard it, I heard it put this way before. Um, if you don't believe the Lord is speaking to you or you cannot hear God, open up your Bible. <laughs> and I think that's the best way to know that you're hearing from the Lord. Um, really quickly, if you can for me, if you, um, now, you guys, what I'll do, I'll have you just scoot over and make more space. If you have a seat next to you, to your left or your right, if you don't mind scooting that way, and that way those that are coming in will be able to have a seat when they come in. So there's an empty chair next to you, if you don't mind just scooting to uh, your sides, and that way they'll have somewhere to sit as well. And so pretty much if, if, if we want to hear the word of God, hear the voice of God, the best place to be is in the word. And so that's where we're going to go. So let's pray and we will uh, dive in. Father, I thank you for our time together this morning. I pray, Lord God, that you'll open up our eyes, our spiritual understanding. We may see amazing things in your law. Help us, Lord God, not to get involved with emotionalism or sensationalism, but help us to fall in love yeah. with the truth claims of Jesus Christ. Let the word of God be the foundation, the principal things, the choice things in which we live our lives by. Let the word be our final authority in every aspect of our lives. I pray, Lord God, that we will not only be hearers of the word, but doers of the word as well, not deceiving ourselves. Help us to hear the word, receive it with gladness. Hold on to the word and plant into our hearts. And as Joshua proclaimed, let us meditate, roll over, and chew the word of God, that we may observe to do all that we see written therein. And then we will have good success, and you will make our way prosperous for your glory. And we give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. So if you've been with us, we're in the book of Romans chapter 1, and we're going to pick up where we left off last week. Romans chapter 1. And on the screen, it'll be in our King James, it'll be in King James Version on the screen. And if you have a Bible, please bring one when you come, because um, that's all we're going to talk about, amen? Um, it's always great to look in your Bible and see it for yourself. You never want to take the word of a preacher or a teacher. You want to see it for yourself. Know what the word of God says for yourself. And then take um, notes if you're able. That way, when you leave here, you'll be able to go back through it during the week and meditate upon that, chew on it, and roll over in your mind to apply that to your life. So Romans chapter 1, and let's start with verse 22, and then we'll just read through um, verse 23, and we'll kind of knock out 23 today, and perfectly we'll knock out 24 as well. And so Romans chapter 1, verse 22 says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Remember, we're talking about Paul speaking to the Gentiles of that time, and they were literally walking away from God as far as their belief systems. And Paul was coming to bring that correction. He was coming to bring that structure doctrinally to make sure they understood that the natural revelation they received from God, that they would be drawn closer to God versus to their own flesh club, versus to idols and things of that day, whether it was the scholars of their day, whether it was the philosophers of their day. Paul wanted them to know that there was only truth in the revelation of Jesus Christ. And in this time, it was natural revelation. But he was saying that they had took the truth of God and they put a lid on it through vertical ungodliness and horizontal unrighteousness. So he was saying the reason you cannot give honor and gratitude to the Lord is because your upward sin toward God and your horizontal sin toward others has put a lid on your ability to show honor and reverence to God. I don't know about you, but in my own life, whenever I wasn't living right, it was because I was putting a lid on the honor I should give God, and I was putting that lid on through vertical ungodliness and horizontal unrighteousness. That's why what we sin uh, is called sin consciousness, because there's a consciousness of missing the mark toward God, and when a person is living in sin, they normally run from him versus to him because of the knowledge they have of their sinfulness toward him. Does that make sense? That's why when we sin, many times you go hide into a dark corner because the consciousness or the awareness of missing the mark. If you're married, you'll find that if you miss the mark, many times you don't want to get all huffy and puffy. Many times you become real humble when you miss the mark. Right? Because that consciousness, that awareness that, oh, wait, I missed the mark. And then those that do get puffed up is because pride tells you, although I missed the mark, I'm going to live as though I never have. 
That's what Paul's telling them. You guys have been puffed up now. You're now professing yourselves to be wise. Remember, we talked about last week that when mankind had the chance to name themselves, they called themselves homo sapiens, mm -hmm. the wise one. Remember, that's what it means. Mm -hmm. And then those of the homo sapiens that were the more highly intellect, we were calling those the philosophers. Though that, that word means to be in love with man's wisdom. So in essence, Paul told them, you guys are professing to be in love with your own wisdom versus the wisdom of God. And as a result of that, God's judgment is pending against you. With me so far? Yeah. So looking at verse 23, and they'll uh, pull it up for him. Romans chapter 1, verse 23. And it says, and change, remember that word change in the Greek does not mean they actually change God. It means they exchange God. Are you with me? So you can't change the immutable. You can't change the one that is unchangeable. So what happened was they exchanged the glory of God, of the uncorruptible God, into the image or the likeness made like unto corruptible man, and to birds, and to four-footed beasts, and to creeping things. Now, that just seems really, really like general, just random, but this verse has so much impact all the way from the etymology of man, talking about way from the time of the beginnings of Genesis, all the way fast forward to the New Covenant in Romans. And so many times if you're just reading your Bible, you will read through Romans 1, get to this verse, just bowl through it, go to verse 24, and keep on rolling, not realizing there's literally an entire history in this one verse. So if you've been asleep, just wake up. But we're going to unpack We're going to unpack this verse. But I believe when we get done, you will see this verse, and this is, it, it may become one of the, one of your favorites once you realize what it means. It's absolutely amazing. So let me give you a few thoughts. We're going to jump right into it. That way we're on the same page. Um, we talked about this idea of idolatry. That is to put something above God. Remember that? That's the whole context that, 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 that Paul is talking about. But let me tell you, as it relates to practically speaking for our lives, if our, our daily life, per se, is, if, is a lie if these three things are not true. Number one, if we're not living our life according to God's will, our life is a lie. It's still a life, but it's an idolized life. Number two, if we're not living our daily lives directed toward his glory, our life is a lie. And thirdly, if we're not living our lives for the realization of his enjoyment, then our life is a lie. What does that mean practically? Let's go through each one. Number one, I shall live every single day of my life according to the will of God. I shall wake up saying, God, I want to perfect and live out your will today at the highest level possible. Uh, uh, making it applicable, whether it's my children, marriage, singleness, whether it is me being a... Um, a widow, whether it's in my business, whether it's in my job or vocation, God, I want to live according to your will. That's step number one. Step number two now, I want to direct all of my thoughts and actions toward your glory and for your glory alone. Meaning, everything I say should bring you glory. Everything I do should bring you glory. The only way we can offend horizontally is if we first offend vertically. So the way in which God is most glorified in me is by me being totally and completely satisfied in him. And I do that by living for the purpose, number one goal, of glorifying God. So God, should I go here? I don't have to ask. Going there doesn't bring him glory. God, should I say this? I don't have to ask. If I say that, does it bring him glory? God, should I do this? I don't have to ask. If I do it, does it naturally glorify him? If the answer is no, watch. Go back to number one. It's not according to his will. You with me so far? Mm -hmm. How do I know his will? It will? Whatever you do or say will always glorify him. Thirdly, this is the part we usually miss. Number three is the realization of his enjoyment in us. Everything I do according to his will that brings him glory, God enjoys watching me do it. Yeah. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. So now I'm not living for my enjoyment. I'm not living for my spouse's enjoyment. I'm living for an audience of one that God may look at me and God be well pleased and say, I enjoy watching Kenyon glorify me every day. I enjoy watching him live according to my purpose. I find excitement in him obeying my word. Why? I'm living according to his purpose. God gets no enjoyment if we're not living according to his will. He gets no enjoyment if we're not living directed toward his glory. God is not pleased if our aim is not for his fulfillment versus our own. 
So what is he saying? That Paul said in verse um, 23 that they changed or they exchanged. The Greek actually means that they acted without good sense. He said these people that are changing the glory or exchanging God's glory, the uncorruptible, to make it look like it's corruptible, they are not acting in good sense. He said they're acting foolishly. Now, really quickly, we're going to move on. In verse, 20, um, verse 23, when we realize, he's saying we've exchanged the images for what's corruptible, right? Mm -hmm. But now, just write this part down because we'll get there um, next time. But write down Romans 124, and I'm going to have them go there if you're able to. Leon, for the screen, that way they can see it really quickly. I'm going to give you three. They're back to back. So it's 24, 26, and 28. But write down Romans 124. I just want to give you a picture you can take it home with you and look at it. What happens is there, there are degrees within the same punishment for ungodliness. Now, mind you, you have ungodliness, which is sin vertically toward God. Unrighteousness is sin horizontally toward man. But now when you're dealing with this context... God is, um, through, um, through Paul, he's not dealing with their unrighteousness. He's dealing with their ungodliness. Why? Idolization isn't a horizontal sin. It's a vertical sin. Are you with me? But there are levels within the same thing of idolatry. Does that make any sense? So it's idolatry, but there's levels to it. Watch how Paul shows that once you start down the road, how far it goes. Look at Romans 1.24. It says this. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness. Underline uncleanness in your Bible if you're able. Through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. So the first one he gave in verse 24 is to watch this. Wherefore God also what? Gave them up. There are some people God's not holding on to. So once you get into ungodliness, he's telling you, God gives them up. This is the first level, though. So will God would give somebody up? Yes, he would. Look at verse 26. He didn't say it once. Verse 26, look at this one. For this cause, God what? What are you talking about? But wait, though. Up unto vile affections. Underline that. For even their women did not um, even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Wow. But he's not done yet. Go to verse 28. The third time Paul's addressing ungodliness, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God what? Amen. He gave them over to a reprobate mind. To do those things which are not convenient. So what he does is he's showing you ungodliness once a person in their mind become conceited. When they no longer want to glorify God but glorifies oneself. He's saying you have now taken the glory that comes from the real God and you've made yourself an idol. And you begin to worship yourself. Then God disciplines you through ungodliness. And the first step on how you got there, you were unclean in your lust in your heart. Mm -hmm. Then what happened was because you still were prideful in your heart, God let you roll yourself over into vile affections. And then because you kept on going and sin, God gave you over to a reprobate mind. So in essence, God is saying, it ain't that I had to let you go. It's that I had no option but to let you go. Why? Because you kept rolling away from me in deeper and deeper ungodly to the point to where I was no longer God. I became man and you became God. So in essence, God is saying, I'm not going to share my glory with you. Are you with me? Wow. So what, so what, what make it practical? The punishment of ungodliness left alone. Is being given up by God. So if a man will not worship God as God, he is so left to himself, Mr. Key, he eventually throws away his very manhood. You throw away your existence to change who you are as corruptible into a pretend figure as though you're uncorruptible and you're not. So we're going to go further. 
So what they exchange, verse 23, they exchange the glory, which means God is the glorious object of worship, meaning that man should be the person that has full humiliation and God should receive all honor and all glory at all times. What they change the glory of the uncorruptible. Now, I love this part because uncorruptible in Greek, it applies God in opposition to man. It is given a compare and contrast. He's saying that God is uncorruptible, but man is corruptible. And what he wants to do, he wants to show man, let me show you how foolish you are for exchanging the uncorruptible for corruptible. Mm. With me so far? Mm -hmm. Uncorruptible means this. It means unchanging. It means indestructible. It means immortal. The word conveys the idea that God is eternal in every way, and he's incorruptible, and therefore he should be the proper object of worship. Make it more practical. In man's life, all things change. We come, we go, we live, we die, we grow, we get elderly, but God stays the same. With me so far? Man decays by age. Man decays by infirmities. But then you come to God and you can know with a surety that God undergoes no change at all. He's the same yesterday, today, and what? So what he's doing is I'm showing you that what you're, desire, you're, you're deciding to worship is changeable in every aspect. And the one you're leaving to worship the corruptible is unchangeable in every aspect. So now, when man goes through hell in life, you can't ch turn toward the uncorruptible, the unchanging. You must turn to yourself, who is always changing and corruptible. Meaning, don't look to me when you need help. Look to the one in whom you worship. But the problem is, had you been worshiping me, you would have had confidence that when I go back to God, he's unchanging. When I mess up and I go back to God, he's unchanging. When I find myself in sin and got to repent and want God to receive me, I'll go back to God and he's unchanging. But now that I'm not worshiping God, worshiping myself, I can't come to myself to rescue myself. Oh, so in essence, God is saying, I'm going to leave you with the recompense of your reward of sinfulness and ungodliness. And that is, I let you go. Mm. Not only to serve yourself, mm. but to save yourself. Yeah. Mm. Do you see it here? In essence, all I did was this. I didn't push you. I just let you roll. Why? Watch this. Because everything in you was already rolling. I just no longer restrained you by my grace. Restrained you by my mercy. Why? Because every time you roll from verse 24 to 26 to 28, once you reprobate, me holding you is now injustice. But releasing you reflects my character. Holy justice. What? Giving you what you want. Are you with me? So what does he say? It's going to get deeper in a second. I'm just trying to lay it for you. We've changed the uncorruptible God into an image. The word image in the Greek means a representation. It means the likeness of a thing. He's saying you can't change God, but you can change the imagery of who God is. You with me so far? So the word idols, it implies representations of heavenly objects. So man is exchanging God for the image, likeness, or, re or the representation to substitute God for what was never the original, man. So what am I doing? I want to take the corruptible, take the uncorruptible, man and God, and switch the roles. Mm -hmm. Then I say, I am God, and he's made in my likeness. Mm -hmm. It's a lot on that. To what? The corruptible man? So back in the day, during this actual time, you had the Gentiles who were worshiping Jupiter, Hercules, Romulus. They all attempted to have all these different gods to what? Idols. To replace the uncorruptible with the corruptible. And as a result, you find they were having substitutes in the likeness of man. So in man, in essence, they exchanged the intimate, direct relationship with God for a shadow of his form, but lacking the traits that actually made him God. 
So what they do, they went and they found imagery that looked in the form like God, but did not have the power of God, the character of God, the attributes of God. So they wanted the likeness without the power. The likeness without the character, this is the key. The likeness without the rules. So what do I do? I don't want God because God comes with his character. His character comes with laws, systems, governments. Yeah. So what I do is I exchange God and all that he requires for an imagery of God that does not hold me to no standard. So they look to Romulus, Hercules, all these. Why? Because the moral standard didn't exist with these guys. Are you with me? Let me make it even more practical. It's like having a significant other, girlfriend, boyfriend, husband, wife, etc. And you can go to the movies. You can go out to dinner. You can go lounge on a couch, take a walk on the beach, hold hands, cuddle. You can touch that person. You can see that person. You can smell their perfume or cologne. And then all of a sudden you say, you know what? I don't like all the rules that come with you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of you. Then I'm going to have a magazine across the country FaceTime the magazine, see a picture of you without your essence, without your attributes, and then say that FaceTiming a picture of you on a magazine across the country is equal to the imagery and the intimacy of you being with me on the couch. <laughs> right? If you're with me on the couch, you're with me on the couch. I can talk to you, hold your hand, then I lie to myself and say, hey, babe, it's a magazine, though. It's a picture of you without any of you in the picture. Why? It's not living. The picture, the idol, isn't alive. It doesn't have power. It's not incorruptible. It's not eternal. It's just an imagery right. of the real thing without everything that makes the real thing real. Right, right, right. Are you with me yet? Yeah. Why? The magazine can never correct me. Yeah. Hmm. The magazine can never judge me. The magazine can never sentence me. Why? It's an idol void of power. But the real God has a real standard, real judgment, real justice, and for the believer, real mercy and real grace. But if I don't want everything that comes with him, I can't change him. But what I can do is exchange him for something, watch this, less consistent. What? Something that's corruptible. Now, are y'all ready? <laughs> that was on the foundation. <laughs> I've been waiting for this part. Are y'all ready? You gotta lay the foundation first, right? That way I'll lose y'all in a second. You can get lost quick coming up, so. <laughs> now, in order to make this make sense, but, but what time? Am I on track? You know, my wife will be calling, like, you going over? 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock, yes. Now, turn to Genesis chapter 1. Now, mind you, in verse 23, he said, we changed, leave that for a second, Leon. It says, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man. Now, watch this. Not only to corruptible man, but to what else? Birds, four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Now, that part you would skip, typically, right? Let's not skip it. Let's go back to Genesis for a second. Genesis chapter 1. Remember, birds... Four-footed beast and creeping things. Now, Genesis 1, 24, I'm going to read through verse 28. I want you just to listen to see if we can find any of the imagery in Romans 1, 23 and Genesis 1, 24 through 28. With me so far? So Genesis chapter 1, verse 24 and we're going to read through verse 28. And it says in King James Version, And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle, and the creeping thing, and the beasts of the earth, after his kind, and it was so. 
And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and the cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was what? Yeah. Good. And God said, now watch this, verse 24 and 25, everything was what? Made after its own kind. After its own kind. So when you look at the beast, the cattle, the creeping thing, everything was made after its own kind, right? Look at verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our what? Image. After our likeness. And let them have dominion, watch this, over the what? Fish. Over the what? Fish. Over the what? Yeah. And over the whole earth, now watch this, and over every what? That creeps upon the earth. Now, if we're careful in our examination, we will find from verse 24 to 26, and we compare it to Romans 1, 23, you will find birds, four-footed beasts, and creeping things, all from Romans 1, 23, all present in Genesis 1, 24 to 26. All of them are there, every single one. Now we think, wait a minute. The birds, creeping things, cattle, all that are made after their own kind. Then God gets to verse 26 and let us make man not after its own kind, but after our image. So now there's a distinction between cattle, creeping things, birds of the air. A distinction between now mankind. Right. But let's go a little further, verse 27. So God created man in cattle's image. No. No. In every creeping thing's image. No. In the birds of the air's image. No. no. And God created, verse 27, man in his own way. Image. Watch this though. Not his own person. Right. Not his own being. He only made man in the imagery of himself. It matters. Why? Because man, although made in the image of God, were corruptible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which means cattle wasn't even made in God's image. Man was made in God's image, but he was not made equal to God's person. All right. Amen. Amen. Now stick with me for a minute. This is going to go deep in a second. <laughs> but it, it's levels to this thing. Cattle, man, God. Just stick with me. Verse 27. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created him what? Male. Now wait a minute, which lets me know male is not greater than female. There is a system of structure in the family where man is the head of the wife, but Christ is the head of the man. So even though there's a system of order in the home, there should be no differentiation of value and respect in the home. All right. Why? We're both made in the same man's image. All right. Just think with me. Verse 28. And God blessed who? Them. Them. Which means in the home, the man is blessed and the woman is blessed. So God's not blessing you more because you're a man. He blessed the man and the woman the same. Then he says this, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. Now watch this. And have what? Dominion. Dominion. Now, now, now let's pay attention to the, to the words. He made man in his image after his likeness. Then he said be fruitful and multiply. Then God gave a clear script of what man would have dominion over. All right, all right. Let's look at it. Have dominion over the what? Fish of the sea. Fowl of the air. And over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Romans 1, 23. Birds, four-footed beasts, and creeping things. In essence, God gave man and woman dominion over everything we're talking about in Romans chapter 1, verse 23. Mm -hmm. What he never gave man dominion over was himself. Watch this. Not only himself, each other. 
So man and woman have dominion over all the cattle, all the four-footed beasts, all the creeping things, all the fowl of the air that don't have dominion over each other, nor they have dominion over God. Anything made in God's image, you don't rule over. With me so far? That's why human trafficking is sinful. Mm -hmm. Because it's you having dominion over the image of God found in that boy, girl, woman, or man. Are you with me so far? Now, let's make it all make sense. So go back to Romans 123. And it, it, it's, it's like the devil's in the detail, right? <laughs> you gotta like look between the crack of it and say, ah, I found you, Lord. The idea becomes this, looking at Romans 123, and change the glory of the uncorruptible God, which means exchange, into an image made like to corruptible man. Watch this. He's saying there is a heel slanting down when you're in ungodliness. The way you know, remember we talked about the vile affections and we talked about the reprobate, all that kind of stuff, how it just rolls. He's saying, this is how you know you're in ungodliness and you're getting yourself in trouble. It's not that you find yourself worshiping animals. Before that, you'll find yourself worshiping self. Mm. Mm. He, he mentions the order on how you become reprobate. In the verse, he shows you, yeah. like to corruptible man. He says, first thing you're going to do, you'll start trying to dominate man. And you never should. Yeah. But what happened is, you'll worship things on this level you should not worship, man-wise. Right. Then you'll get so off the cliff, you'll begin worshiping imagery not even made, watch this, in God's likeness. Come on now. That's why you'll worship money. Mm -hmm. Not made in God's image. But it's more equal to a four-footed beast. Something that is created to what? Benefit us, not for us to actually serve it. It should serve us. Are you with me? Now, it was never God's design to have man to begin to worship the very objects he gave man dominion over. Are you with me? So four-footed beasts, birds of the air, creeping things, those things were created for our benefit and usage. Not for worship. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. Make it more practical for our day. The car you drive, the place you live at, the job you have, the relationship, whatever it might be. It is for your benefit, not for your worship. Mm -hmm. So things that God has put in our purview of dominion, house, car, money, etc., materialism, those things should serve us. We should never worship them. When we begin to worship them, we will find ourselves bowing our knee at an altar where God is not at. Right. Are you with me? So God has dominion over all of mankind. So why would God ever turn around and worship his creation when he's the creator? Right. Mm -hmm. When we worship materialism, it's equivalent to God worshiping us. It's out of order. Are you with me? We're going there. Just stick with me. What sin does, ungodliness in this text, it drives man away from the true object of worship and causes man to begin to bow its knee to the very things that man should rule over. And so in Paul's day, the great principle of pagan idolatry, which is to worship things outside of God, is that they begin to adore every object that they thought was important that brought them benefits. So whatever made them feel good, whatever benefited my life, whatever added to me, they begin to worship that thing versus worship God. So Paul is saying, you guys are looking at these animals because they are tilling your ground and bringing you crops and benefiting your life. And versus, versus giving God the glory for creating the beast, you have turned your back on God and worshiped the beast and gave the beast the glory that only God deserves. Yeah. In essence, you begin to worship the job and worship the business and worship the money versus worshiping the God that gave you the power to attain it. We're exchanging the glory that only belongs to him and for the uncorruptible and giving the glory to the corruptible. And God says, I won't stand for it. Now watch this. And I got to stop here and we're going to pick up next time. So why is that important? Because this is what happened in the garden. Are you guys ready for this? This is so good. 
Remember, the pagan idolatry is you begin to worship the creation. But look what happened. Think back in your mind for a moment. Genesis chapter 3. The stage is set. Adam and Eve in the garden. The serpent comes and begins to beguile Eve, trick her. It says, did the Lord say, right, the whole entire conversation, that you can't eat of all the trees in the garden. Think of how crazy that was. He actually told her the opposite of what God said. Did God say that you can't eat of all the trees? She should have said, no, it's the opposite. He said, I can eat of all of them except one. But what happens is he moves in. And this is what he does. He wins a victory over man in Eden by falsely representing God in the image of man. He falsely gets man to believe that God is holding something back from you that you have the power and the right to have. He's lying. God knows in the day you eat, you will be as him. Genesis 126. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion. Satan was offering them the imagery that they could live in that they already were. But caused them to believe they were not. I'm offering you a car you already own. <laughs> and I get you turn your back on God to get what you already are. But God knows when you eat, you will be just like Him. When the reality was, I'm already like Him. The problem is, you want me to pretend that I am Him. How? By restructuring the rules of the garden. How do I do that? Do the opposite of what God told me to do. Which is what? Go eat, meaning that now what I do elevates above what God said. You may eat freely of anything in a garden besides that tree. When I go eat of that tree, I elevate myself above the authority of God, and I become an idol. Uh, I hope I see it in a second. <laughs> what happened in heaven? When, when Lucifer said, I'm going to raise my throne above the throne of God, as lightning he was struck out of heaven. Lucifer knew, wait a minute, God has an order of things. When I move God down and move up, he kicked me down. So if I can get them to move God down, and move themselves up, he'll kick them down too. Watch this. He kicked Satan down, kicked Adam and Eve out. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it gets better. Just, just stick with it really quick. Give me like two or three minutes, and I promise you it'll all make sense. So what happened was Satan fraudulently advertised the debacle in Eden was a victory not only over Adam and Eve, it was a victory over God himself. Watch this. Go to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. I'm going to stop here. This is so incredible to me, I could just scream. Look what Satan did, though. This is why he was so cunning. Because he knew he had a revelation about God that man did not. That God was unchanging. That God was eternal. And he knew